You are now listening to Out of the Blank. blank, blank. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. I'm here with Susanna. Susanna, tell me a little bit about yourself and what do you do professionally? Ah, so I am originally from Finland and I live in Australia in New South Wales at the moment. I have two kids who are six and four year olds and I do podcasting as well as I used to have a business which I recently closed down and I'm in the process of selling it off. And I don't really have a profession. I'm like a house mouse, housewife, uh, flush, uh, everything else in between. Um, I used to do nursing before I had my, um, before I moved to do overseas from Finland. And I lived 10 years in London and then I lived in Auckland before I found myself in Australia. And that's interesting because a lot of people, they usually get afraid to come out and say that they're they're a stay at home mom or they're a stay at home dad, and I tell you some those are some of the hardest jobs ever. Um, you don't really take a lot of people don't take into account if it doesn't earn a paycheck, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't make any sense to me because I can tell you right now, I know some guys that are stay at home dads, and it's changed their life completely. It's made them a better person. Um, they've learned to be amazing care providers. I've watched a, a kid my own age, 22 years old, um, just literally raise two kids. And seeing that change in him where I was like, this is not going to be good for the children. But, man, he's taken amazing strides and learned so much. And I, I to see someone truly care for something, I and mean, you're caring for a bit of you in a way. Yeah, because kids are, they are a reflection of you. They are a piece of you and, and your partner or your husband or your wife. And, you know, raising them like I was not very maternal person before I got my two sons, I have to admit. But when they were born, you were just like, oh, my God, this is like the best thing ever. And I have to say that my kids are pretty rowdy. They are quite full on. <laughs> And uh, sometimes almost too much, but you wouldn't, you know, change it. You know, I just love it, you know, being at home. And I don't think there's any shame admitting being a house mother or housewife or house dad <laughs> or just taking care of your children. And yes, it is a job and you don't get paid for it. But sometimes the most unexpected things actually makes it the most rewarding. Like today I was uh, watching my kids doing uh, swimming and my older one was doing particularly well. And he just was striving and he had hurt his ankle a few weeks ago and he was just doing the best swimming he's been doing in the whole term. And even his swimming teacher was saying, like, look, this was the best that he's done. And things like that and just seeing the happiness and the feeling of he's achieved something on his face when he came off the pool was just like, yeah, you know, I'm happy to stay at home as long as I can, but I'm sure my husband will have uh, other ideas. As soon as my youngest one goes to school, I think he might think like, okay, it's time for you to go to work as well. Yeah, I think oh, at least back in the day, it, you know, it was crazy because, you know, women didn't get rights until too long ago. And it made you think for so long, like, what were we thinking before that there had to be, the woman had to stay home, the guy had to go get the job. I can tell you, I know women that go and they bring home the money they bring home everything and mm. the guy just sits at home and does all these things i'm like there's no such thing as men or women jobs there's stuff that you would stereotype to be a man's job you, there's stuff that you would stereotype to be a woman's job but we all come down to people our genders may switch you know our genders may defer but we're all down to people in a way i podcasted with transgender people and they talk about like how they're looked at like freaks just un misunderstood and it all comes down to feeling comfortable and being who you truly want to be in this world. You know, right now you're telling me the story of Susanna. You're not telling me um, a, a type of character, a type of act. And you're, you're literally just conversating with me, giving me the realness of anything. And you can relate that. It doesn't matter your gender. It doesn't matter your race. It doesn't take much to just sit down and have an hour conversation with someone. Yeah. And um, I think just before we started, we were briefly 
you know, touching the topic that not a lot of people do conversations, like how easy it is to text people rather than pick up the phone and call them or just having a conversation. You're right that we become this society where it's so easy and you know Australia it's the same thing you know as much as it's in, in Europe where I was just traveling with my family and and same thing is in US that these digital devices they take over the world and it's very interesting I was in the tube which is the metro the underground um, in London and I remember back in the day when I lived there and I was observing the people and people were always reading a book or uh, the newspaper and you get these free newspapers in the underground station and people always reading them on their way um, back from work and now everybody had either iPad or had they had the iPhone and in the olden days and this was only like 10 years ago when I lived in London and people still like having conversation they might not necessarily know the people next to them but they were still kind of conversing and you didn't have this awkward silence that you have now when I was looking at these people I'm like oh my god it's like zombies on their devices so yeah that was quite shocking yeah, they, it, it keeps our attention for so long, too. What really, really scares me is the way we're going with technology, um, only on the factor of we're not being connected into each other's lives anymore. Um, it's very, very difficult, I, probably coming from a mother's perspective or coming from a parent's perspective, um, to if you're a single parent working two jobs. Um, like my parents worked two jobs, and it was not easy. Like they didn't have a lot of time that we're home, able to have moments. And as I'm 21 years old and older, it's very, very hard because I don't have that need for connection at this point. I'm trying to branch off and do my own things. And I can sense that they want that, but it's not something like before where I wanted it. And now I'm like, eh, you know what I mean? And I try, and, <laughs> I try my hardest to kind of see it and take it where it stands, but you don't ever want to lose that, especially like you having two young kids. You you want them to be in the moment. You don't want to do the types of lazy parenting techniques that a lot of parents do nowadays because it's so much easier to shove a tablet in a kid's face so he'll stop crying. It's a very, very good point there because um, we had friends that we went a dinner with and we don't give iPhones and we don't even have a tablet to give to our kids, let's be honest. And iPhones, we both my, me and my husband have, but the kids know that they are not allowed to touch them. So um, they were uh, they were having their kids and same age boys. And first thing they do, they pull the tablets out of their bags and give them to the boys. And I look at my husband's like, are you, you know, effing kidding me? Like they're giving those to their kids. And there was a play area in this restaurant, which was, you know, meant for kids to be used, you know, if kids want to get up from the table and they want to play or run around, whatever. So there's an area for that. But no, they have these tablets and the parents thing is the most, you know, normal thing to give iPad to the child so they're quiet and don't disturb the adults when they're having conversation or when they're eating rather than trying to have, <laughs> I don't know, family time and speaking with your kids. So then they were asking, so don't, don't, doesn't your boys have tablets? And we were like, no, we don't, we don't give them, we don't have them. Even if you would have them, we wouldn't give them <laughs> in a restaurant. And it was kind of an awkward moment there. And they were like, oh, okay. Yeah, there's, <laughs> like it was a, actually, there's a it was, tension between like the newer age parents and the older age parents. Like, yeah. wait, you, don't, you don't give your kid a tablet. How do you deal with his just mindless screaming and shit? And you're like, oh, I'm an actual parent. See, I like to stay connected into my kid's life. You know, I don't want to wait till he's older. And then me trying to message him, him not texting back for five days. Like, I, I understand coming from a mother's perspective here when I get a text or I'm from a parent, from a grandparent, and there's either whoever, depending on whoever raised you, and there's a fear when they don't text back immediately. It's like you're waiting for that text. You're waiting for that thing to come in. Like, are they okay? Are they? There? And the next thing you know, it's been a couple of days, and you haven't texted back. A kid my age wouldn't be like, "Sorry, I didn't get the, you know, sorry, I didn't get the text back on time." But coming from a parent's angle and knowing that you have this child that's out there experiencing the world, that has to be the most fearful thing in the world. And it's true. A mother's job is never done. You know, long after they even grow up, everyone kind of chalks it up like. Oh, you have a kid? Well, that's going to be an 18-year debt. You're basically paying off an 18-year <laughs> loan. I'm like, no, it's not going to. It's not something you're looking for a payment back on. You know what I mean? Mm. It's 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 about raising something and caring something and watching something grow up. When they learn, like for me as a kid, 
learning not to touch a light bulb because it will burn you. You know, they told me not to do it. I ended up having to experience it myself <laughs> until I burned my fingers and I was screaming my ass off. You know, there, there's these moments you have to like, you're literally watching someone develop and you see bits and pieces of yourself in them. And it's something that can literally bring a tear to your eye. Yeah. And I have to say that those parents who gave those iPads to their kids, they are good parents. Like they do love their kids. They, you know, take them things and places and they pay attention to them. But there's moments when you just, do things differently and like I like my kids to explore things I like them to experience things and I want them to make mistakes and learn from them like you know put their fingers on a hot hot thing and burning it if that's the way you know you learn you learn by doing things and doing mistakes but I think um, some of these parents are they think that it's kind of the parenting device and they don't even understand like you know, my parents were like, yeah, when you were kids, you know, you were sitting at a table eating quietly. And then when you were done, you asked, can I go away and can I go to play? And we gave you permission and that's the way it was. But nowadays yeah, we just kids have... are just entitled to go do whatever they want yeah. afterwards. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, I don't know, it's just, it's kind of like entitlement, you know, like we have all this money and we're spending on devices and stuff because, you know, it's easy. It's easy way of out rather than having that argument or conversation with your child. It's crazy because they, they talk about the world being so much more connected than it ever has been. That's very true, but we're not connected in the way it matters anymore. We're connected to our phones and connecting over social media rather than having engaging conversations. You want to know a really shocking fact that literally had mm -hmm. me stop and and just stare off and be like what the fuck happened and that's the concept of family dinners in the average american household are not happening actually in the average household are not happening like they used to i'm not surprised at all because that's kind of the trend you see in most western countries the so average family that used to eat seven days like have dinner seven days a week together and have like a good 30 minute meal it's now three days a week and even then it's maybe 10 15 minutes they basically shovel the food down their throat and then run upstairs and watch netflix or something yeah because if you think about the devices like you said that you know we should be more connected but we are actually further apart you know as humans as people from each other than you know we were you know 100 years ago, for example. Yeah, you might not have digital network 100 years ago, but you could send postcards and letters and you could travel, actually go and see places rather than going to the virtual reality of internet or uh, Netflix to go and check out. So what is the war in Afghanistan, for example, about? Or what does Australia actually look like? Yeah, well, it's funny because we, we choose to invest all of our worries, concerns into problems that we really honestly can't do anything about especially when it comes to trying to shape someone else's, like some first comes to you with advice or comes to you asking for advice, be more than happy to give them advice. But then you start investing yourself in that person, you start to lose track because people are not perfect, okay? There's things going on in my life I can improve. There's things going on, I bet, in your life that you can improve. Subtle things. You know, Leonardo da Vinci said it best. Art is never finished, just left undone because he believed you can constantly be working and adding something to your life to make it better or to a work of art to whatever. And it, it, it brings into the whole concept that we have this mindset as people where it seems like we're walking around a little bit with a mask in a way because we're very, very disconnected from one of another, one of one another's lives when it comes to the concept of just understanding and communicating nowadays. It feels like when you strike up a conversation, you're waiting for someone just to throw a bunch of horse shit at you just throw the, the whole problems of their day to the point where you're like whoa i just asked if you knew what time it was and they're like sitting there oh sorry <laughs> that's quite actually quite uh to the point because in in english we you have a small talk when you ask hi how are you you expect to get back i'm fine how are you don't you so in finland where i'm from we are actually were very much the opposite. When you ask, how are you? We actually tell you how we are because we want to give you an honest answer. So my Australian friends always have the giggles because they, they know when they ask me, hi, how are you? I'm going to tell them like, yeah, this happened this week. I'm like, next week I'm going to go there, holiday about this, kids that. 
And they're like, within three minutes, she's kind of giving us like what's happened in the past few weeks when we just wanted to have like the nice, hi, how are you? I'm fine conversation. Yeah, it's it's difficult because I think what makes that increasingly happen more, um, at least nowadays, is the concept of we're not communicating like we used to. Social media is now our outlet for us to get our anger about our problems throughout the day. It's a way to get an acceptance from others when it comes to someone just listening to us. You know, someone puts up a fake, uh, puts up a Facebook post and says something like today was crap, all this, and just starts complaining about their whole day. A bunch of people like it, even though they're just mindlessly scrolling, see your name. Okay. Like it and scroll down. They don't even read the actual thing. And sadly, you can have a million people like your picture, share your picture, comment on your stuff, and it gives you an acceptance feeling. It gives you like you like something you did mattered. And it's not mattering in the true form because I can tell you right now, that million of people that are giving you that acceptance, that number is going to keep increasing uh, for the amount of requirement you need just to feel accepted. But you can easily have that real conversation with someone like, hey, this is what's going on in my life. Can we sit and talk about it for a minute? That connectivity and that just just explaining that to one person and them understanding you and then them maybe saying stuff about their day to you, that's a better than the millions of faceless people out there that are accepting and liking your status. Yeah, social media is about instant gratification. It's about you feeling good about likes and follows and comments and et cetera, et cetera. And those uh, social media platforms are being designed for us to get that hooked feeling that, hey, someone liked my post or I had a new follower. And that's why we keep going back to it. And it's just, you know, it's just triggering all those, you know, addiction points on us. And on our children as well. That's why they like to go back to the pads because they're, you know, doing Fortnite or uh, Minecraft or whatever else they're playing because it's just in a form of addiction. And I know there's a lot of children who are being treated for addictions and in terms of uh, digital, you know, addictions. And interestingly, Stephen Jobs, the uh, father of um, I, um, Apple, he never gave iPhones and iPads to his children until they were 14. So I think that should be a lesson learned for all of us. There should be an age requirement on when you're able to use a tablet. I definitely agree. Agree. Six years old um, with a tablet, you don't need to be eight years old. I have a little cousin that sits at the dinner table on his phone and his aunt just lets it happen. I'm like, you're missing moments, bro. He's like, what are moments? I'm like, there's these things that you're going to get nostalgia. You're going to get memories. You're going to get all these things. And you know what they're all going to be? They're going to be mindlessly scrolling and looking at a screen is going to be your nostalgia. I had moments as a kid, you know, going camping with my father um, at a bonfire at two o'clock in the morning at the age of 14, 13 years old. And we were eating seafood. We were eating shrimp and crabs by a bonfire at two o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday. I was supposed to be in school, but I wasn't. Those moments are stuff I look back on and go, that was a major turning point in like my life where you had a connectivity with a parent. You had a connectivity, even though they, like my parents worked two jobs, it was hard for them to have those moments and stuff, but there was still time to sit down, watch a movie, even nowadays, I'm like, let's plan something out. Let's do something. Okay. We're both experiencing a life. Obviously we have stuff going on. If we have to schedule in a day, let's do it. You know what I mean? Because sadly nowadays, everybody's doing their own thing. They're getting their own stuff done, which they should be doing, but it's not as easy, especially when you're a small little kid and you literally, you don't have anything. You don't know any knowledge about the world yet. As a parent, that gives you an easy time for when it's capable for you to just grab them and be like hey let's watch a movie or something yeah i so agree with that because um kids they love experiences and they do remember the experiences like the camping one they don't remember the fact that they've been sitting on dinner table watching movies in an ipad and it's kind of a sad state of reality that you know <laughs> we're talking here about something that you know in my generation it you know, com uh, mobile phones came maybe in the 1980s when I was still like 15 year old or so. So it's just so short space of time, you know, 
the way we interact with as a people, as a parent with children has changed, as well as what we think is important. And if, for example, at school here in Australia, there's uh, lots of talk about the use of, of iPads in terms of education. And they do use them, but they use them in Finland, which is the best education system in the world. But the way they use them is different. And Australia is trying to find a way how they can do it without it becoming disruptive and without giving the bad rep that, you know, because at the end of the day, digital, digital world is around us and we live in a world where you have to know how to use these devices, whether you like it or not. Because if you don't know how to use them, it's going to hinder you later on with your studies and with your work. So you have to find a balance how you educate children about the good things about this digital world and these devices, as well as making sure that they understand that, yes, you can get addicted and yes, there is possibility that but they can be used in a bad way as well. I think everything can be done in moderation, to be 100% honest with you. I mean, as taking off from working a professional career to going and being a stay-at-home mom, also known as the Nordic mom, but <laughs> how, did you, like, how did you even decide to call yourself the Nordic mom and call it like the lover of the Nordic life? Like, what do you do differently that would be considered? Um, that's a very good point, actually. Um, coming from Finland, it's just the way we approach life in general is very much more about being simplified. Less is more. So whether it's your food, whether it's your clothing, <laughs> whether it's your, you know, just your lifestyle that you don't have to have the newest things. So the new living is very much about simplifying things. So coming from the corporate background like I was traveling the world and seeing amazing things and being involved in amazing things but it was not fueling me anymore so when I become a mother and I wanted to stay at home and wanted to find an outlet for something I started looking back into my roots at where I come from and the way I was brought up and all these good things that you can find from the Scandinavian countries and how I can you know, be the catalyst of getting more people interested and involved in terms of what the Scandinavian life is about. So that's kind of gave where the Nudic Mom uh, name came about. So um, as, as what has kind of changed, I guess, from your professional career to going and being a mother? What types of things have you seen in your personality that have kind of changed? Are you a little bit more caring? Are you a little bit more patient, obviously? Um, in my corporate career and, you know, working in the, you know, <laughs> industry where I was, I was quite of a risk taker before. And, um, I'm also a pilot. So I do like taking risks, um, professionally as well as personally, but becoming a mother, then you realize even flying a plane that you have to kind of think about, someone else first that okay if I now crash this plane <laughs> if if something happens who is going to take care of my children so you have this little fear in back of your head when you live your life because you always start to moderate things more towards being less risky so risk adverse rather than being the risky person I used to be and I would say yes of course you're more caring and you have to learn a lot of patience which I'm not famous for <laughs> and uh, I've had to learn to you know just take a deep breath and just you know let things flow and pick your battles with kids and something just have to let things go. Well, uh, what types of things do you do when your kids are at school because I know this is a problem for some stay-at-home parents when it comes to um just the concept of they feel like you know you when you when you're a stay-at-home parent you invest your time into your kids so you know your kids are always there you can drag them along to the grocery store you can do multiple things but what do you find like I know with some parents they get stuck watching soap operas they live their life kind of by and they're on Facebook all the time but after a while it's like literally having a day off you just get bored constantly what do you try and find to keep yourself entertained oh my god I don't have that problem. I would wish I had that problem, but I don't. I spend lots of my time either working on the business that I've just closed, which I'm in the process of selling, 
or I work on my podcast. So interview like you do, editing, getting the artwork done. I'm also do studying at the moment. So I'm doing a lot of course about podcasting, another about a business, running a business, one about social media. So I have a lots of balls that I'm juggling up in the air. And then between all that or amongst all that, I have to also do the grocery shopping and do the laundry, do the dishes, keep the house tidy, pick up the kids, take them to the sports and then somewhat in everywhere in between all that have the time for my husband as well so I don't have that problem I wish I could just have a day or two just plonk myself in front of Netflix and just watch everything and anything under the sun but I just never seem to have that time to do that and when I'm not you know doing anything like you know the podcasting or if I'm not doing you know, studying, then I would be hiking or going for walks. We live a beautiful place just by the beach. So then spending time in the sea as well when it's warmer weather as well. So yeah, I, I wish I would have that kind of a problem. So what types of things, I guess, do you podcast about? Just just being a parent or just certain things that women are interested in? Um, so the podcast is more geared towards, I interview Scandinavian women um, who have either business or they are bloggers or bloggers or anything. So they have a Scandinavian background. They might have a Scandinavian business. They might be living in Scandinavia or they might be living overseas. So everything in between that. So I interview them. We talk about their journeys. How did they you know, end up from A to B? What they're doing? We're talking about being a Nordic person, Scandinavian, living overseas or living where they are and how they keep up their connection with their home language and their country. And then I do solo episodes where I talk about Scandinavian concepts like the school and education. I talk about the Scandinavian minimalism as a lifestyle and anything else. But in everything Scandinavian and Nordic, then that's what we go on about the, the podcast. What about the education system exactly? Because it's got to be different from the one I had here. I mean, I see great strides in what we've done with our education system now, looking more on the basis of mental health, where it seems like it's becoming an ever-growing issue. It seems like younger mm. kids are affected now with anxieties and types of disorders. Um, it's hard for people to understand that. Like you hear an eight-year-old kid say he has severe depression and they go, all right. Yeah, sure. Okay. No, um, it's, it's, it's real. It's happening out there. I, I took psychology classes and, you know, I'm fascinated with the human mind and it comes down to the concept of we're living a life comfortably numb to be hundred percent honest with you. <laughs> you know, we're totally completely oblivious to the main problems in our life. The one that we should structure, make a list around on things we need to work to have, but we're so in, overwhelmed by immediate problems, whether you have this, whether you have that, whether this is coming, whether that's coming. We don't take the time to find, prioritize what problems truly matter. And it's sadly, it seems like when you are trying to keep your kid from being exposed to what the real world is, um, it's, it's that exposure is hitting them at younger and younger ages. I mean, I was 18 years old or 16, 17 years old when I realized, holy shit, I have to pay bills? Wait a minute, wait a minute. There's a thing called filling up your car that's not just free gas. And it, those moments in my life, like I want to, I have my times nowadays where I want to go back. Like I wish I was 12 years old. I did not understand what the hell was going on outside of my Xbox. <laughs> I mean, that is so true. Like the education that you get from school, does it really ever in any country, literally, does it really, you know, make you understand what is the life outside of the xbox i mean finland education system is one of the best in the world uh, that's you know just a fact and it's always on top of all those big polls and um, uh, index and world reports it's always in the top and few of the things that why it is in the top is because teachers are very well educated they all have master in education even if they are kindy um, preschool um, teachers they have to have a master in education to be able to work with children same goes with primary secondary high school they're all very well educated these teachers and teachers are very much respected and they are given the freedom to implement the curriculum of the subject and it's not like there's someone 
putting lots of pressure on them and asking that, okay, have you done this? Have you done that? So my sister, who's a teacher in Finland, says that they are much more free to implement things than they perhaps were, you know, in some other countries or even in Finland maybe 20 years ago. But, you know, I mean, mental health, it's an issue in every country. Here in Australia, where my kids go to school, there has been a lot of talk about mental health issues and how how the schools are, you know, acting towards bullying, for example, how they are looked upon that they have to do more. And then we start looking, okay, well, what about the parents? What are the parents doing? Because the school and education system can only do as much. There has to be something done by the parents as well. So if the parents are not parenting the child and it's only the school who's supporting the kid, then you are about to have problems. Whether it's, you know, mental health, whether it come out as a mental health issues, they might come, you know, as a person who's been bullied or they become the bullier themselves and, and they will start inflicting aggressive behavior towards their peers. So they can be everything and anything in between. And maybe my question to you would be like, because in Australia, we haven't had this, thank God, because it's something that has happened in Finland, is the school shootings and where kids will, small as eight, nine-year-olds, get educated what to do and how to behave. You're duck under your table, you know, block the door and stay quiet in terms of if something like that happens. So is that something that was in part of your education as well when you were at school? You know what happened when I was in school? I, we had earthquake drills, we had fire drills, we had a strange person broke into the school drill, what do we do? But that was once a ye- every year or so, because it was not frequent. Nowadays, mm. my cousin comes home, tells me about his day at school. Oh, we had a shooter drill practice today. Mm. What? Yeah, we all got into a corner. I'm like, what? Like that's that's a normalized thing. You didn't have a fire drill. No, we do this about once every couple of weeks to make sure you know we're all prepared. Or in case something happens, I'm like, in case something happens, like what the hell? What happened? What happened to people? What? I, my theory is people became full. You know, you're going to see shootings happen more and more and more on the concept of we're not connecting and having conversation in the way we're supposed to be having conversations. You're supposed to sit, you're supposed to talk to your family. You're not supposed to sit and go out, have a nice dinner together where it turns into everybody staring at their phone screen and not having conversations anymore. That scares Mm. the living crap out of me on the concept of I see it affecting older people now and i see it affecting younger and younger generations so where that's going to be the norm um when i go out to dinner i remember like the moments back when i was a kid going to tgi fridays or going to applebee's (laughs) or something and sitting with my grandparents and we were just enjoying conversation after a long week of school that we'd go over to my grandparents house for the weekend and that's always what they made sure we did me and my brother my grandfather my grandma all went out sat down i got the same thing chicken tenders and french fries honey mustard on the side mountain dew i I remember everything they ordered i remember getting potato skins with bacon on them i remember all these wonderful things but it was a way of conversationalizing again you know we spent summers up there too and those moments like my grandfather like all you do is play the xbox i'm like he's right though because i I feel like i can't connect but i remember watching cowboy movies with him i remember working outside and uh, you know cutting the grass at like five o'clock in the Mm. morning and him teaching me to get up early go seize the day you know these types of moments that he's been passed down on to me and these are stuff i look back on and I, I see all those moments where I was so addicted to this thing because I did grow up like, you know, parents worked all the time. Nobody's really home. So it's like, hey, you're by yourself at the house. You're going to watch movies or you're going to play Xbox. You're not able to go outside and go have fun because you're still a kid. You know, you don't have a car. You don't have really the capabilities of going over a town or going 30 minutes away to a friend's house. So um, it was always like, you know, just attach yourself to this Xbox. And I look back and I'm like, there were benefits from it when it helped me connect to my friends. But I still remember the nights I used to go over to a friend's house and, you know, your dad's like, or your parents just like, here, here's 20 bucks, man. This should last you the weekend. That night it was gone. I don't, I don't even know <laughs> how if it was an hour or two later, but we're talking about pizzas, Mountain Dew, playing video games all night with my buddies. Best moments of my life. 
You know, I wish I could do those now because as we got older, these people that you thought were going to be in your life constantly, they're not there anymore. You know, I, I experienced that recently losing somebody and it's not, it's something you look back on like, damn, I remember those moments and now he's not here anymore. And we never took time to do it now. It seems like with kids my age, the only way we can connect now is if we force ourselves to talk to people about this, um, that have a podcast with other people. They say the only reason like they get to hang out nowadays is when they have to do a podcast together because it makes everybody break out of that comfortability zone and feel like they have a, uh, like they're required to go do this and create this content. But once they get there, everybody's having fun and enjoyment. But the sad thing is when you walk through your door, after a long ass day at work, or if you walk through the door after just a long day in general, associating with people, you want to just crawl into bed and you just want to stop doing anything. Yeah, I recently had a conversation with my uh, my children about death, and they're six and four. And um, how this conversation came about is that um, a friend of theirs it has a cancer. And we were trying to explain that, you know, cancer and what cancer is and how it affects you and that she might not, you know, make it and that we can't go and see her in a hospital because she is in isolation. We don't want to take all the viruses and bugs and bacteria with us to her. And, um, and my son was then asking, so what does it mean when you die? And you're like, you know, he's six and he's asking the smartest questions ever. And I'm like, oh my God, how am I going to explain this? And I remember a friend of mine saying that this, you should always try to be honest with your children because don't try to you go sugarcoat things and don't try to give them the pleasantries because you need to be honest with them. And yes, yes they might be small and they might not fully understand everything but the more you talk with them and the more you explain them the more they actually will then put it in their head and they think about it and then they come back with questions which my son keeps doing so I was explaining that you die that you go forever sleep and you're never going to wake up from it and then he's asking so where are you going to sleep and I said well usually you go in a coffin and the coffin goes underground because if everybody who's dead would stay on the ground you know there would be too many you know coffins everywhere so we have to bury them somewhere and this was the most bizarre question that we, not the question, but the conversation we were having. And um, then he asked, so when you die, are you going to go to sleep? And I said, yes, I will go to sleep as well. And you will go to sleep and daddy will go to sleep one day. We all go to sleep one day. And then he said, so can I come and wake you up? And I was like, no, you don't wake up from the death. And it was just the, the, the volume of questions from a six-year-old trying to explain what the concept of death is because it's very abstract to them. For us, it's not, but for them it is. And then trying to just explain that, you know, you won't be able to see your friends and, and the friend who might pass away, you won't be able to talk to them. They won't be able to talk back to you and they just won't move and they're just gone. And uh, when we were, we were in Finland a few months ago, my great grandmother or their great grandmother, my uh, grandmother is 90. And um, she's quite fragile in terms of like she's old and she's gray hair and white skin and all that. And, and <laughs> my six-year-old asked me, whispers like, is she already dead? And I said, no, no, she's not really not dead yet. <laughs> she's just really old. And this is what happens when you become very old. So, yeah, look, kids, you know, there's all sorts of these things that we try to explain them and we try to protect them from, you know, the unpleasantries of life, but then sometimes I think it's probably better that they experience them when they're a child and when they're younger and they can take on board what they learn from them and just, you know, use those feelings and those emotions and, and kind of make sense of what this world is about. And it's a difficult time to bring up the conversation about death too. You don't know what age is right for them to be associated with that so it's you know, never right i don't think so but they, you have to have the they have to be aware of it yeah i think mm. it comes to the same concept of when i bought it when i got a goldfish uh you know they didn't expect it to live as long as it did um i had a beta goldfish or a beta fish and uh you know the average lifespan for one of those things is like two years at the most my fish lived for six years Oh my gosh. That yeah. My so mom's like, God, is this long. thing going to die? Is this thing going to die? I need to let him know that death is a thing. 
okay? Death needs to happen. So we we ended up getting uh, one of my uh, uh, smallest little dogs. Of course, um, my mom wanted a dog, so we got a dog, you know? Everybody mm. else everybody else was kind of like, ah, oh, we don't really need a dog. And, you know, next thing you know, we have a dog. So it was awesome. Um, my mom originally got it to help my grandma with the passing of her father, um, my mom's dad. Um, mm. And we, she, they live up in Florida. So they're a good about 14-hour drive away from us. And I was so little at the time. It was only a year and a half. I had no idea what was going on. But my mom gave her this dog. And next thing you know, we turn around. We're about eight hours into our drive. My mom gets a call from my grandma saying, come pick this fucking dog up right now. <laughs> and she's like, what do you mean? This I got you this to help you kind of like, you know, not be alone. She goes, this dog is nuts. We show up to the house. And this is how my mom recounts this story. Apparently, this small little Maltese puppy grabbed a blue pen with its mouth, crushed it. <laughs> my grandmom had white carpet white walls everything then ran around the house covered in blue ink and got it everywhere stained into the <laughs> floor and everything so we had to, we had to take that dog home that night and that she lived for 17 years like she died when i was 18 i think almost 19 and it was one of those moments like it, it hit me it hit me i think they expected her like you know an average lifespan for a small dog is 12 and 11 yeah. and you know, it, it, it hit me hard. And it was like, that sucked because I know I'm older and I can try and understand it now. And it still brings me up to tears. I had two dogs I lost, but it was like, those are moments you needed as a kid to understand that this is a thing. And it's very, very hard for a parent to kind of bring in that conversation, whether it's about death, whether it's about the birds and the bees, that awkward one you never want to have. I think <laughs> we choose to make it so stigmatized because we still, parents still look at their kid as, as a baby, you know, even when they get older, you're going to see your kids when they're 30 as still your child. And it's like, you remember those moments, you're still going to look at them and see the little toddler that, you know, wearing his car's underwear or whatever. Um, it, it's, it, it, it really boggles my mind to know that like you might get like, there are some families that are connected and there are some that are disconnected, you know, that it, those relationships happen. Sometimes two personalities, especially if they have nothing to bond over, they don't click, but to truly cut that person out of your life, it is difficult to say or do only on the concept of they're always going to be that person in your life. They're always going to be mom. They're always going to be dad. They're always going to be your son, you know, it doesn't matter if you know them or not, adopted or not. I don't know if you feel um, that way about like with adoption, but you know, a parent doesn't have to just be blood. It could just be as much as someone provides the love and care for you that you need to grow up and become an amazing individual. No, I agree with you. And before I had my kids, we were actually um, thinking about that we might adopt rather than have our own biological children. But um, it just had happened that um, I fallen pregnant and, and we were happy enough to get two boys. But you're right. Like, you know, in my life, I, you know, my parents and my sister, but uh, my grandmother, who's who's 90 now, like she's been a big figure in, in my my life. And, you know, I look upon her like she was still 85 and she was traveling to Paris to with her girlfriends. And that was only like five years ago. And I was just like, I want to be like her when I'm older, like all this energy and things that she's done and places she's gone and, you know, surviving the war and, you know, being a nurse, the war and all that is like, you know, wow, like, you know, look at the life that you have lived. And then I want to be like her. I want to be like her when I'm older and have all that energy left. And, you know, she, yes, she wasn't always there, but when I needed her, when I had to speak to her, someone about something that you didn't want to speak with your parents, she was, she was always available. And even now, like when I call her, you know, she gives me the rundown about the family dynamics and uh, all the gossip that, you know, when you live overseas, you don't necessarily get to uh, uh, experience on the, on the first hand, but she's uh, sure to keep me up to date with that. Um, in terms of um, life in, you know, working, as I know, well, working, being a mother, I would say that one thing that I always, always cherish from my childhood is the fact that I had a lots of cousins and having those cousins around and having like 
I had my sister, but then having cousins around, which is kind of this extra layer of sisterhood and brotherhood and all that going around, that was always just amazing thing. I don't know if you have cousins and if you have the same experience that, you know, you have this extra, 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 you know, close, you know, relationship with Especially someone. Especially when they're around your own age too. I yes. Have, I have a couple of cousins yes. that are around my age and one's a little bit older than me. One's a little bit younger than me. And there's another one that's like a little bit younger than the one that's younger than me. And then I have uh, one that's kind of a gap. And, uh, but it was crazy because I had cousins from Hawaii. So when they came over, I was getting a whole new experience. They had a Brazilian mom, they had, you know, a surfer lifestyle and they spoke this word called pigeon. And it's basically, yeah. it's a, it's like a bonics. It was so hard for me to understand. It Pitch in English. <laughs> like, I'm literally like walking past like um, like a, a restaurant or a McDonald's or something in Hawaii. I'm like, do you want to stop and grab a quick bite before we head to the beach? And he's like, no, nah, I'm full on aloha. Thank you. I'm like, what did you just say to me? Can you <laughs> talk slower? And he goes, I'm full on aloha. Thank you. And I'm like, we're walking past it right now. If you don't tell me, we're not getting food. I'm just letting you know. And he's like, oh, it means I'm full on love. And I'm like, oh, okay. Well, what, say yes or no, you fucking insane son of a... You know? But I was like, it was a way to connect. You know, he was older than me by only a couple months. And then the one behind me was only younger than me by a couple of months. But it was that connectivity. And you saw different things. And they're not my real cousins. They're me and my brother are half siblings. So mm. that's his side of the family. But they treat me like one of their own. And for the longest time, I thought there was some, there was a, always that requirement in me to earn the love when it came to mowing the grass all the time, you know, helping out my grandparents. They weren't my real blood grandparents, but, you know, me and my cousin talk about it. My cousin was on my Christmas Day podcast and I, he was adopted. Nobody knew about him. My grandma had four kids. OK, um, one died of cancer and we thought he didn't have any kids. And wow. we just found out about him like a couple of years ago. And oh, man, this was just last year on Christmas. And it was like, I met this guy who's 34 years old. Nobody knew was, was, was around. Nobody knew about this kid. And it was me just on that podcast, learning and talking to him, like learning everything. You know, this is me learning on the spot. You're learning as I'm learning about him. And it doesn't matter when it comes to blood. Yeah, you have your bickering arguments. You don't get along with your family. I mean, if you're locked in the house with your family seven days a week for a month, somebody's stabbing <laughs> somebody with a butter knife. It's happening. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's crazy because it doesn't matter when it comes down to blood. It comes down to how you treat the person. It comes down to the meaning of family. There's no restriction on blood. There's no restriction on anything if they're a real blood cousin or not, you know. Their, yeah. their influence in their, in their life onto you is the same thing why I have best friends that are practically my brother. You know, people that I truly care about is because I've had this bond, this connection with them that has hit down so deep to where I know I can always count on that person. Do you think that nowadays that we perhaps have friends who are even closer than our families? Oh, and why for is that? sure. But why is that? Oh, it's because it the, the bonds you have with people. It's like I, I, I try and treat my podcast like having a bonfire at 2 o'clock in the morning. You don't know exactly what was said. It probably wasn't educational, but it was a moment that you remember with that person forever. And I think it's mm. the concept of nowadays people, they only talk to you or associate with you or help you out if they can get something for themselves out of it. Nobody goes out of the way to truly help somebody out, you know? Um like for me, I hold the door open for everybody. It doesn't matter who you are, young, short, whatever. It doesn't, and people look at me and they go, wow, thank you. And I'm like, you're welcome. And then they go inside and they go, I didn't expect that about you. I was like, what do you mean? They're like, you're just one of those millennials. I'm like, you're stereotyping, man. We're not all the same, okay? <laughs> I'm 21 years old and still have not bought a legal drink of alcohol. I don't like alcohol. I don't want it in my life, so I don't choose to do it. I have friends that do it. Good for them. Actually, I consider it a beneficial thing, too. My one buddy, my best friend, who I consider my brother, New Year's Eve is my birthday. We're getting drunk and watching the ball drop on a podcast. It was one of the um, most amazing experiences of my life on the concept of I've never felt more connected to him in a way where I consider him a brother. He told me because he lost his own brother. Mm. And 
he lost his brother to an opioid addiction. And he told me, he was like, I might've lost one, but I gained one because you're part mm. of my family. And his mom treats me like mom. She's like, call me mom. Do you need anything? Do you want to come over for dinner? And I'm like, I come from kind of like a, not like a whole, like, Oh, we're going to sit down and play a board game type family. I come from more of like a, you know, like, Oh, Hey, how's it going? That, that type of thing, kind of learning to do your own thing, structure yourself, be very like independent. And they send me those messages and I look at them. I'm like, Oh man. They're like, well, Hey, we're having family dinner. If you want to come over, I'm like, it's so weird to me. It's like, uh, it's like you're sitting down playing fucking Monopoly. Like, how boring is that? I'm like, the only best part is, is when you're a kid, you get to be like, ha, you went bankrupt. And they're like, okay, you're grounded. You're like, what? <laughs> what happened? But I, I'm in total belief that best friends can be closer than your own family. It's, it shows when it comes to how you can truly connect with someone. There's people that are um, best friends or have family members that are just friends and because they don't have anyone in their own life that are intimate in that way. And sadly, as people, we have a social skill. We have a meter. It's like eating. You need, you need that requirement. You need a hug every now and again. You know, you can't be completely cut off all the time. Yeah, you're right. Because um, I've lived overseas since 1999, which makes me sound very old. <laughs> and uh I have lots of friends in Australia and UK where I lived 10 years before moving here. And then, of course, friends that I have, you know, met in Australia. And those people have become more closer to me than my family. And I don't think it's, you know, completely because, you know, I live in the other side of the world, literally, to my immediate family. But I think it's due to the fact that, like you said, you need the physical hug every now and then. and you have just more in common sometimes in the most unexpected ways with people that you meet and you make connections and you make friendships with than your actual blood relatives that you see once in a blue moon and they don't come to mean that much to you. And you then like actually like when I was in Finland, I met all my cousins and their children. I have never met their children because now I live away. So I have, I know that there was a lot of, you know, uh, second cousins around. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is like, you know, who are these children and what their name and age? And then when you spend time with your cousins, you're like, oh my gosh, it's just like it was yesterday. Like, you know, I know you, you know me. Well, yeah, all life is good. And it yeah, was almost are. like like you met yesterday, like you had the conversation yesterday and then you just continue where you left. Yeah, it's like, it's funny because it's like that with some friends too when you create like mm, a mm. bond, when you become True. like a brother with somebody or a sister with somebody. It's just like there's a connection where you don't have to talk every single day. You don't have to do all those silly things. You can not talk for months, but when you do see each, see each other, it's like none of that time that you didn't talk, it didn't happen. You're, you're right back to where you guys were before. It's not even yeah. a whole concept. You know, my buddy was sending me a message, sorry, work's been weak, sorry, we can't talk or do anything, I've been kind of busy. I'm like, dude, we're both living lives right now, you know what I mean? Like, it's very, very hard when you graduate from high school, people think it's going to be sleepovers and all these wonderful things doing together. No, the real world hits into effect, okay? You got to deal with work, you got to deal with problems, you got to deal with things that you're trying to do, you got to deal with exhaustion, you got to deal with a whole wave of stuff where you don't really spend the night at a friend's house anymore. You don't do these types of things anymore. Um, down to the concept of you have to learn to become an adult. You have to learn to try and make a living now. And I think that's, you know, that's something we're all going to have to face at one point. I think as a kid and then becoming an adult, it was very, very hard for me to realize, oh, shit, like bills are a thing. You know, quicksand is not as important as <laughs> cartoons made it when I was a child. I actually thought of this recently. I think when they talk about quicksands and cartoons, they talk about the, the, the negative stuffs of life that hold us down in a way. I think that's the quicksand they were warning us about. And it seems like everybody nowadays has fallen into that quicksand and can't get out. They feel like they're stuck. They feel like they have no meaning in this world. They feel like their life is just an endless routine. And I tell them, we're all interesting in our own unique ways, you know? My buddy, he loves making IKEA furniture. That is the <laughs> tasking thing I have ever heard anybody be interested in. I'm uh, he's the one person I probably don't understand the most, and I think that's why I'm fascinated about him because he sets 
all his tools out, lines it up perfectly, counts everything, writes it down, uh, does an inventory, like a stock, a logistic stock on it. And then he goes, okay, I have six screws. I got this, came in this, got this, that, 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 that. And I'm like, what are you doing? I'm like, like seriously, like, do, do you not just open up the box? Do you read the actual instructions? He's going over the instructions. Then he recounts everything on a separate paper. I'm like, bro, it's four hours now and you haven't even started. And he goes, trust me, you got to do it right. And then he builds a beautiful <laughs> shelf. And I was setting everything on top of it. He's like, but the whole day he wouldn't shut up about it. He was just like, <laughs> look at that shelf, dude. Are you just jealous that your liquids and all these things that you place on that shelf are going to be stable probably for years and years to come? Like there could be an earthquake and that shelf will still be there. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, keep talking about it, dude. Seriously, keep talking about it. Okay. And then next thing you know, he said something and I just full force hand slammed it down i mean knocked the whole thing off the wall everything and he just looked at me he goes why why <laughs> and i'm just like you did that to yourself you did that to, you you forced this to happen and it's it's one of those moments where like even with your best friend like those little small arguments you get there sometimes you guys kind of might get into an argument you're like yeah but it's just like how siblings fight you know what i mean if someone yeah down to the basis of like if you have a sister if you have a brother if you have a family member that's getting picked on it doesn't matter if you guys just got into an argument it doesn't matter if you guys haven't talked in weeks if someone's picking on your family you step up you go hey only i can do that shit yeah and um i'm looking at my boys when they are you know playing nicely together and then they're playing not so nicely together and they you know, chasing each other around with something sharp or something really heavy in their hands. And you're just thinking like, oh my gosh, you know, these moments will pass, but, you know, you have this bond forever. You are brothers forever. You are there for your, you know, for each other forever, I hope. And that you're there to help each other when you need to. And, you know, you will have little fights here and there. I still have fights with my sister, even though we're on the other side of the world. If you're going to listen to this, my sister, yes, you know what I'm talking about. And um, But it's still like you're still family and, and you have to, you know, work around with those quarrels and, you know, issues that you have and, you know, you just have to get on with it. You know, life is too short to start, you know, burning bridges and you know making things worse than they are and yeah my friends you know there's friends that you know I haven't talked to long time but then when you see them like I saw this lady I haven't seen for seven years and in London it was just like it was all like yesterday like I can't believe we all have like four children between us and get married and everything but it was the conversation was just the same and it was intriguing and it was lovely and it was like it was just like yesterday and those are the kind of friendships that you want to cherish you know for a long time because you know that you know you can count on those people to help you and you are there for them when they need you you know in time of need you know what susanna thank you so much for doing my podcast it's been amazing a pleasure talking to you <laughs> i mean teaching me the 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 norwegian or no the nordic mom why did i say norwegian the nordic <laughs> mom herself you know, yes, it's it's hard because for me, I'm not very good with geography. Like I just, I only know Canada is above us and Mexico is below us. But like I have <laughs> students that come over from Russia, Bulgaria, Serbia that I talk to and become friends with. And I'm like, yeah, write me when you get back home. I I, I want to know more about your country. Like you're 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 on like the the, the you're like near Asia, and they're like, what? And I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> like you know what a map is? And I'm like, yes. And they're like, okay, we're not even close to Asia. I'm like, what? <laughs> They're like, yeah, this is our country. This is Russia. I'm like, oh, it's all not one thing. He goes, no, this isn't Pangea. This isn't where we're all connected at one point. This is, we're, we're from completely different locations. And I always get them mixed up. I'm like, hey, what's up? And I'll say something in their language, like, Kakwo Stava is Bulgarian for what's up. And the one person <laughs> will be like, I'm Romanian. I'm like, what? There's a difference. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't know. Okay, well, I don't know the Romanian word. You'll have to teach me. And they're like, "Yeah, don't associate with the Romanians. Like, we don't, we don't associate ourselves with that that, that side." I'm like, "But you guys are right next to each other. Like, how yeah, do but that's why they don't like each other. It's like the Finns and the Russians. We don't like each other. But then we have a little fighting going on with the Swedes, which is our other side. We like the Norwegians because we only have a small border with them. We love the Danes because we have no connection with them whatsoever. And the so you know, it's like the brother, the next door." 
know a neighbor you love to hate. Yeah, and the Bulgarians and the Romanians, they go like, oh, the Romanians are gypsies. And the Bul- oh, oh, no, the Bulgarians go, the Romanians are gypsies. And the Romanians go, the Bulgarians are savage barbarians. And I just look at you both and go, you both have gypsies. You both have these things. I understand the Romanians seem that like they're a little bit more in touch with the sensitivity and their emotions, which I can see why you're calling them gypsies. And the Bulgarians are honestly <laughs> savages when they come to the a- aspect of they're hardworking. They've been through a lot of crap. They're an older country. Um, and I'm like, I understand, but you guys both need to understand, like, I couldn't tell you guys apart. It's like looking at a, a white person and seeing another white person. Like they kind of look the same to someone of a different ethnicity. You like yeah. I I create not bordering on race or where you're from. I create about who you are as a person, what you choose mm. to display to me. If you treat me with respect, we'll get respect back. You know, we're all in this world together, trying to survive. Worrying about race, worrying about gender, worrying about all these things are just small little infractions in our life that we need to stop holding so damn accountable for things. Mm, I agree. And, you know, coming from the Nordic countries in Finland and up north in Europe, so living in the life in Australia, it's, um, you know, it's a metropolitan society where you have people from everywhere and anywhere and all your neighbors are different ethnicity and you just have to get along with everybody. And it's very different for Finland where it's very homogeneous society where we are all white Caucasian and we all have the same <laughs> clothing and we all look the same pretty much. So we're yeah. all trying to live on this earth together. And let me tell you something, Susanna, like I said before, I appreciate you being on my podcast and teach me what it means to be a Nordic mom. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Is there any uh, type of things you want to promote here, like your podcast at the ending? I want to give you a minute just so people can find your awesome content and hear a little bit about your story and your thoughts on the world. So if you want to go and check me out, you can go on um, thenordicmom.com where you can find my podcast, my blog post, a little bit about me and what I do. And you can also hang out with me on Instagram, The Nordic Mom, or Twitter, Nordic Mom Podcast, and Facebook, Nordic Mom Susanna. So those are the you know, social media platforms I hang out the most and you can come and say hello. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much for being on the podcast and thank you for working with the time zones. I know it's night there. We're probably <laughs> getting ready for bed here soon. Yeah, I am. But uh, no, you have to do what you got to do. Yep, exactly. And for anybody out there listening, just understand that, you know, you can be an average day individual or you can be like Susanna and live a Nordic mom lifestyle.